diagnose thyroid disease properly? In the dog, we use the total. We use the total T3. T4 has four iodine molecules attached to it. T3 has only three. How does T4 become T3? It loses an iodine when an enzyme called a deiodinase removes the iodine from T4 to become T3. And 80% of that occurs in the liver. The other 20% occurs in the brain, in the skin, in the kidney. But most of it occurs in the liver. So obviously, if you've got significant liver disease, the ability of the body to take T4, which is the inactive reserve form of convert it to T3, which goes into the cells, is impaired. Now, the free T4 is the free unbound fraction of the total, and it's 0.1% of the total, a very tiny amount, as I mentioned earlier. Similarly, the free T3 is a tiny fraction of the total T3, and it's the unbound fraction of T3. And these are the biologically important forms of the parent hormones. T4 autoantibody is a case where a circulating antibody is in the blood against the hormone. T3 autoantibody is where a circulating antibody is in the blood against T3. These are not common. They occur in about up to 20% of patients, of dog canine patients that have autoimmune thyroid disease will have circulating antibodies against T4 and T3 in their blood. The problem is they make the amount of T4 and T3 that the test shows you erroneous or spurious. So when you have a T4 autoantibody, this level can be look really high. When you have a T3 autoantibody, this level can look really high, when it really isn't. It's because the antibody is preventing the reagent in the test system, which is also an antibody, from seeing the true hormone level because it's coding the T4 and preventing the assay reagent from measuring it, saying with T3. So these can be spuriously affected in the presence of these antibodies. The additional tests we need are TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which I've told you is not a good reliable test in the dog, but we do use it in the cat, and thyroglobulin autoantibody, which is a very important antibody to rule out thyroid dysfunction of heritable basis in the dog. So here's what the thyroid looks like. Here are two dogs thinking that they might decide whether they're going to fight with each other. And here's the thyroid gland in the neck, which you can palpate on either side of the back, Either side, it's like a butterfly-shaped organ in front of the trachea. It will be in the front. This is the back view. Okay, and you can the thyroid gland has a tumor in the cat, for example, or in an older dog. You can palpate the nodule very often. However, don't be fooled about this because some thyroid tumors, especially in the dog, which is rare but still occurs, are in the chest, and so you may not feel them in the neck. So here is a slide that was uh, that I took from my friends uh, at Vitatech in Toronto, the Alfred Chu and his family friends of ours, an oriental family that started this uh, veterinary diagnostic lab in Toronto. And this slide shows you that the canine TSH assay is discordant. It gives you the wrong answer up to 30% of the time. And so we show this slide to remind you when you do this test, you could have any interpretation you want. Could be right, it could be wrong. Now, when people send samples of um, serum to us from all over the world, get breeding stock for thyroid disease so they can get a certificate um, either from ourselves, like Thyroid Gold here, or from the Orthopedic Foundation of America, OFA, which also gives certificates. 
but they have different requirements for testing. We give you this certificate suitable for framing, and it has to be renewed every year. And so the certificate, if the animal passes the testing we do at Hemopet, would have the registered name of the pet, the registered number, the owner or guardian's address, and the testing was completed by the date and then an account number. So the assay for hemolife diagnostics here would have an account number for that particular testing. And the certificate, for example, could be number five. And when you retest it next year, if it pass again, it could be number six, et cetera. Now let's take a step back and learn more about how to identify the inherited form of hypothyroid disease in dogs. And this work was primarily done in England and in Alaska. And we are proud to say that I was involved in collaborating in all of this research some years ago because we provided many of the samples for the testing from affected families that we knew had the problem. But all of the testing they did in research was done double blind. So they didn't, they would know what breed the animal was, but they wouldn't know anything about the heritable background of the animal. The work was done in Manchester, in the United Kingdom, with Dr. Lorna Kennedy and her colleagues in Alaska. It was Dr. George Happ, H-A-P-P, and of course ourselves. One of Dr. Kennedy's graduates, the person that actually did his PhD, um, identifying the markers for hypothyroid disease in the dog. So hypothyroidism in the dog is a complex clinical disorder found in humans and dogs thought to be caused by a combination of genetic predisposition, you have to have that, and environmental factors that trigger its expression, a change in the immune system, for example. Now, in the first studies that were done, they studied the Gordon Sepper, the Hovavart, it's a rare breed, and the Rhodesian Ridgeback. We also studied in our studies the English Setter and the Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retriever, a retriever from Nova Scotia in Canada. Now these three breeds by Dr. Kennedy and also the Italians, Dr. Bianchi, which included Dr. Kennedy and ourselves, showed that there was a particular gene that was shared in these breeds. Three genes were involved, and it was not the same as the dog leukocyte antigen class two genes that are involved in other autoimmune diseases like hemolytic anemia or diabetes. It was separate. So there were three genes involved that actually predisposed these dogs to Hashimoto's thyroiditis, in the presence of environmental challenge. So dog leukocyte associations occur. In humans, this is called HLA, human leukocyte antigen. In the dog, it's DLA for dog. And there were four different haplotypes. So it's um, prepared types of the genes. And they were both protective against thyroid disease and putting them at risk. Different dog breeds had type sets of the genes involved. Some of them, however, were only found in one breed, like the boxer. Some of them were seen in several breeds. And some breeds had no association with the DLA. So there were other genetic markers for hypothyroid disease that were present in several groups of genes. And these genes, like DLA, were common to several different types of autoimmune diseases, like Addison's disease, like diabetes, like hemolytic anemia, like rheumatoid arthritis, like thrombocytopenia, like um, chronic active hepatitis, like thyroid disease. Some were specific for hypothyroidism, and some were specific for certain breeds of dogs. The human form of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is prevalent in the Orient as well as elsewhere in the world, but was first recognized in the Orient, is linked to a particular leukocyte antigen gene 4. We have found changes in the genotype of the canine equivalent gene. 
and this was studied in six dog breeds. The actual allele or cause of the promoter of thyroiditis in the boxer was, has been identified. So we studied the boxer, the Doberman pincer, the English setter, the Labrador retriever, the Rhodesian ridgeback, and crossbreeds of these breeds. So the conclusion then of the recent studies, the studies identified potential novel genes and pathways for the development of canine hypothyroidism, raising new possibilities for genetic screening, making a specific genetic screening assay, which we still don't have, to protect breeding programs and also how to treat dogs before they become serially clinically affected. The region is on chromosome 12 in the dog. The dog has more chromosome pairs than people. So um, dogs have 39 pairs of chromosomes, people only have 24. The major histocompatibility complex genes, called the MHC, are involved in all of this, plus at least four other genetic regions. And regions are found not only on chromosome 12, but on six other chromosomes. But most of the defects are located on chromosome 12. We do not breed dogs with autoimmune thyroiditis because you're going to pass it on to the next generation. So all relatives of affected animals and breeds at high risk should be tested every year, starting at puberty at about 12 months of age. Remember testing the females when they're not in estrus and heat. We consider for breeding if they test negative, and at that point they should have had two or three negative tests, normal tests by then. Now, that doesn't mean they still couldn't turn affected at age 8 or 10, which we've seen that we had an old English sheepdog that was 15 before we diagnosed his Hashimoto's disease. He had already passed it down for four generations. And in each generation, when you inadvertently breed affected dogs, more puppies will turn up to be positive in the next generation. So you're selecting away from the problem when you should be uh, towards the problem, I should say, rather than away from it. That's exactly not what you want to do. So it's a heritable trait, even if the animal is clinically healthy because it hasn't destroyed 70% or more of the thyroid gland, even if the animal is best in shape at a national specialty show or wins an all-breed show in Taiwan. If it's got this disease, it should not be used for breeding. So how do we help control what's going on here? We need to maintain genetic diversity within purebred animals that we selectively breed under our control. Humans are basically genetic because we mostly select our own mates. So it's essential to maintain the healthy health and longevity, the long life of pet animal breeds by increasing the amount of genetic diversity. But breed frequencies for common disorders will vary between countries. So in Taiwan, you may have a lower frequency of a certain heritable problem than we have in North America, for example. So how do you do that? How do you introduce new bloodlines and conserve and protect more diversity? You seek out more bloodlines that remain healthy. You could use dogs also from the same breed that come from other countries. And that's especially helpful in males where we can have fresh or frozen chilled semen shipped all over the world these days so you can get the semen from a dog that's healthy in another country to introduce into the bloodlines in Taiwan, for example, to strengthen the health of the breed. So how can breed clubs help protect the health of their breeds? This is really important. Save the DNA from all the dogs that you have. Get the blood sample in 
the anticoagulant EDTA, perhaps starting when they're puppies. You could also do a cheek swab, but blood is a better sample to, to extract the genes later on in life, and you just freeze it. Keep good health records of all dogs by computer, so you can go back and search them. The DNA from all dogs of the breed. Keep current with all illnesses as the dogs get older. Keep checking them regularly. Record the cause and the age of death for all dogs. And then you can go back and study their DNA that was stored when they were puppies to see if there's a sudden change. For example, in the old English sheepdog, where we looked at the breed for 15 years, we found that female old English sheepdogs lived three years on average less long than their male counterparts. And most of that was because they were used for breeding and never spayed, and so they had reproductive issues, including mammary cancer. So old English sheepdog females lived less than three years um, of life than their male counterparts. That's amazing, and we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't kept the records. So keep the historic records as those of all current dogs for both diseases and their healthy controls. Because if your breed group wants to do a health survey, you have the records to do that. I've been doing that recently now with the, the background of the American Eskimo dog back to their original stock, where they derived from. And we're studying pedigrees from American Eskimo dogs all over the world now to try to look and predict what things we should focus on to keep them healthy. Now we're gonna switch and talk more about abnormal behavior. The biggest reason for euthanasia or putting pets to sleep in a pet home is undesirable behavior because with the crazy lifestyle we all lead today throughout the world, we are working hard, everybody in the family is working, all the children are going to school and hopefully university, we're all developing our careers, we're running, 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 running through life. And when we get home, we cannot keep or abide by a dog or a cat or a bird or an other pet that has undesirable behavior. We just don't have the patience for it or the tolerance for it. And sometimes the pet that's not feeling right will behave abnormally because it's trying to get attention from you to say, look at me, look at me, I'm not well. And of course that just makes it worse because the behavior can't be tolerated. So the association between behavioral problems and psychological changes with thyroid dysfunction has been recognized in humans since 1930, the work of Plowman and his colleagues. Both thyroid function, especially in young children, with psychological changes and behavioral changes has been a problem in people for a long time. As many as two thirds of human youngsters, young children, um, young in, um, three, four, five, six year olds up to puberty, and teenage years with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are hypothyroid. And if those youngsters are diagnosed properly and treated with thyroid hormone, they retain and develop normal behavior rather than giving them Ritalin and other behavioral modifying drugs to change their behavior and make them, quote, zombies we give them thyroid hormones. So it's very important for young people that aren't acting correctly or as expected in a home to be tested completely for a thyroid problem. We see the same thing in dogs with autoimmune thyroid disease and just regular thyroid dysfunction where the dogs have hypo, remember, and cats are hyper. So what do we see? Unprovoked aggression, you come home, your pet is so anxious to see you, happy to see you, you open the front door, you open the front hallway, and the animal attacks you at the throat, <coughs> trying to get your attention, saying, don't bother me, I'm not well. Suddenly they start to have seizures like epilepsy. Now this is not heritable epilepsy that occurs in young puppies or kittens, it's not so common in kittens. These are sudden onset seizure disorders at or after puberty or in young adults that are two or three years of age. The animal can suddenly be disoriented. Who am I? Where am I? Where am I going? And I'm not a geriatric. 
that has cognitive dysfunction of old age. I can be moody. One day I'm friendly, the next day leave me alone. My temperament can be up and down. I can be hyperactive. I can run around the house like an idiot. I can go into the backyard and jump and play and act and bother all the neighbors. I can be crazy hyperactive. I cannot pay attention. Are you talking to me? I didn't hear you. I'm not paying any attention to you. Animals can be depressed like people can. So don't forget, within a household where some tragedy is occurring or an animal or another person is ill, animals can feel depression as well. They can be fearful. They can have phobias, as I told you before. They can be anxious, as I showed you in the pictures. They can be passive. You can do anything to me. I don't care. I'm a limp rag, dish rag. I can be submissive. You pet me, I'll pee on you. I can be compulsive. I'm taking the baby's toy. Yes, I am. I'm getting in the bathtub with the baby. Yes, I am. Or irritable. Don't bother me today. I'm going to hide under the kitchen table. Don't come near me. And then a few hours later, I'm fine. Why don't you hug me? Why are you ignoring me? It's very concerning. So the behavioral changes can be subtle personality and behavioral things that can indicate deterioration of the thyroid gland. So this animal is sad, it's anxious, it's withdrawn, it's submissive, it's aggressive, it has anxiety, it's depressed, and it's very sensitive to noises or other objects it doesn't want around it. Okay. Now, certain um, hounds, certain breeds, are used, like bloodhounds, for scenting, looking for people that are lost, scenting the loss of people or other animals. They're used in tragedies to try to hunt out humans that are still alive in a tragedy, God forbid, or even those people or animals that have died or are terminally injured in a tragedy. There's a family of bloodhounds in Toronto that do scenting abilities. This is Debbie Hawkins. She's an animal health technician, and she raises these dogs. And this is her foundation mother, Hazel. And these four other bloodhounds are Hazel's puppies. Now, of course, they're adults now. Look at the difference in the way they look physically. She had a normal head for a, 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 a bloodhound. This one is very narrow. This one is short. This one is huge, like a jughead. This one looks normal. So this is the only physically looking from this family. And you know what? They suddenly they lost their scenting ability. They went to the tragedy in Oklahoma when the office building was bombed and it fell down on all these people. They couldn't follow the scent. She lost total faith in these animals. And she wrote to me and she said, Jean, I'm devastated. My animals were the best in the country and they don't follow the scent anymore. What happened? So we tested them and all four of these dogs on the ground were hypothyroid. Only Jackson, this male, sitting on the rock was normal. And so she realized that these animals had become hypothyroid. So she treated them and they were able to maintain their scenting ability again. Here's a bearded collie from outside London. And this bearded collie, whose name is Billy, had cognitive loss, lost his memory, and couldn't remember what he was doing. So Billy was cared for by a beautiful school teacher who took care of, taught young children in a school near Ascot Racetrack in London. And Billy would go with her to class, and when she was done, she would go out to the park, and Billy would play with all the children. Suddenly, Billy was hiding under the park bench and didn't want the children to play with him very often. And poor Nick, the, the caregiver, was worried. She didn't know what was wrong with Billy. And suddenly, she was waking up in the middle of the night, and Billy was standing at the end of her bed, staring at her. And she couldn't stand it. She'd cover her head over with a blanket and wait, and then she'd peek out. And Billy was still staring at her. And he kept staring at her and staring at her. And she became so unnerved. So she went to a veterinarian. She went to a specialist. She went to two veterinary colleges in the United Kingdom. And they could find nothing wrong with Billy. She was about to give up one day when she was walking in the park. And some people were walking with another bearded collie. 
they came up to her and said, oh, you have a bearded collie. And she said, yes, but Billy is so sick, I don't know what's the matter with him. So she told them Billy's story. And they looked at her in surprise and said, well, Billy is probably hypothyroid. Did you have the thyroid function tested by Dr. Jean Dodds in California? And Nick said, oh, I never heard of her. That's really weird. So Nick had her veterinarian test Billy, and Billy was indeed hypothyroid. And Billy was treated with thyroid hormone, and he completely recovered. And here he is looking at you all happy again. And I met her about a year ago in England. She came to one of my seminars, and she said, Billy lived to be 12 years of age, and the last nearly two-thirds of his life were normal, thanks to you and the people walking in the park at Ascot. Here's a Shiba Inu, a breed you probably know well, and they're becoming quite popular in North America, although they have a very good temperament. Now, this particular Shiba Inu, the Kushu, was the top agility a uh, contestant Shiba Inu for all of the United States. He won every dog show. Never, never lost. He was high in trial. He competed. He beat everybody. And then all of a sudden, he started acting strangely. And his mom, who lives in Wisconsin, came to see me in Chicago and showed me this picture of Kushu and said, Gene, why is Kushu acting so strangely? I said, well, well, what's he doing? And she said, well, he goes into the agility tunnel and he won't come out. He hides in there instead of running through it and winning in high and trial time. So I send him around again and he goes in the tunnel and he hides. So obviously he's losing and everybody's excited because they can beat him. But I'm worried, what's wrong with my dog? And I said, look at him. I think he has a headache. His eyes are not fully open, they're sort of partially closed, and it looks like his muscles are uh, deteriorating. He's got some kind of dementia, and he's lost his muscle mass and the ability to see, and I'll bet he's got a thyroid problem. Oh my God, she said, I hope so. So we tested him, and here he is after being treated with thyroid hormone, winning his ribbons again, his muscles are starting to grow in under his eyes. He doesn't frown with his headache, and his eyes are much more widely open. Look. Look at the difference. Here's a German Drathar. And the Drathar is an ancient breed from Germany, the ancestor of what is today's German wire-haired pointer. This dog, whose name was Whiskey, was absolutely beautiful. He had a brother also that was equally beautiful. Suddenly, Whiskey became aggressive, unprovoked aggression. And if you look at this picture of him coming through the grasses, look at the intensity of his expression. His very next step is to bite you. Whiskey had autoimmune thyroid disease and he was treated and he became normal. And he came normal until he was six or seven when he started to become a little bit grumpy again. And the family had a grandchild who was two or three that used to come and pull on Whiskey's ears. The grandparents were so concerned that they had him humanely put to sleep and they kept his normal brother instead. Now it took a lot of courage to take this animal who was becoming abnormally um, risky in his behavior again and put him to sleep so that he couldn't damage or harm anybody else. Here's a dog from Holland, and this is a Llewellyn setter, which is a field setter, much like the English setter, only smaller. And this particular dog was normal and then suddenly stopped becoming social in her home in his home, I should say. And he wouldn't play with the children, he wouldn't play with his toys, he wouldn't do anything. We diagnosed him as having thyroid dysfunction from his veterinarian, a friend of mine outside of Amsterdam. And when Dr. Linda Bogey sent us the sample, we diagnosed the thyroid problem and we treated him. Here was his first picture afterwards in August of 2010, picking up his toy and saying to his mom, can we play again now? I feel normal. 
So this is the last slide of the first half of our program today. And this is our book called The Canine Thyroid Epidemic, which is written by myself and my good friend and partner, Diana Labradura Dunitz. And this book was published in 2011. And it was awarded the top health care book for dogs for that year by the Dog Writers Association of America. And we were totally surprised and incredibly um, humbled by the fact that we got this award. And this book is still widely read and successful and can be purchased online anywhere in the world, purchased. We don't make any money writing the books, by the way, but this book is very helpful. And it's written for the level of the individual person even all the, all the research and the references are contained in it as well to document what we say in the book with pictures and case report stories.